Thank you, Co-Chair Persons. Next in line, we have a third plenary lecture. I take the pleasure of inviting the Co-Chair Persons for this session, Dr. Kalum Desha Priya, Consultant Rheumatologist, Teaching Hospital Karapitiya, and Professor Sampad Gunavadan, Professor of Physiology, Faculty of Medicine, University of Ruhuna, to the head table. Good morning. I welcome you all for the session six, plenary lecture three. Uh, in this uh, plenary lecture, questions are not allowed. Uh, the plenary lecture is on the application of evidence-based dietary management in patients with irritable bowel syndrome. It will be delivered by Professor Peter Gibson. He is the professor and director of gastroenterology, Monash University, and Alfred Health, Melbourne, Australia. Now it is over to you, Professor Peter Gibson. Many thanks for the kind invitation to uh, talk about evidence-based dietary management in patients with irritable bowel syndrome. When we look at the evidence for dietary strategies and look at the common dietary strategies that are used, the low FODMAP diet is the only one that has uh, decent evidence to back it up. So I will talk about that. Now, the whole FODMAP concept was one whereby we had a lot of information in the past to say that if you had a large amount of fructose, large amount of fructans, collecto-oligosaccharides, sorbitol, for instance, that it would cause gut symptoms. But these amounts were much greater than what we would normally get in the diet. However, they all have a similar action. And if you add them all up, so one plus one plus one plus one plus one equals five, you might get uh, uh, an effect from their combination. And in fact, there is evidence for that. So the idea was that if we wanted to improve people's symptoms, then reducing uh, one would not really have much effect, which is what our clinical experience was. But if we reduce uh, all of them, then we would get more uh, more bang for our buck, as the Americans would say. So the idea is that uh, that if we can uh, reduce them all in people with irritable bowel and visceral hypersensitivity, then symptoms would improve. Now, one of the problems we met in starting this uh, these studies was that uh, where were these FODMAPs? We had, first of all, to uh, determine a or design a, a new term for these uh, collectively, and that's where the FODMAP fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides and polyols came from. And we knew that they were present in many things, vegetables, fruits, dairy products and cereals. So we undertook a, a long process, which is still ongoing, of measuring FODMAP contents of food to get in a big database of where these FODMAPs are. And you can see here on this uh, slide, uh, it shows that, that many foods have multiple FODMAPs in them. And then the next problem was what was high and what was low and what was moderate. And over uh, years of experience, and clinical trialing, we determined cutoff values for what is high and what is low. The next issue was getting this information out to people. We couldn't publish papers on this because the journals don't accept papers just with 
lists of content. And so this is when the uh, the FODMAP University, FODMAP, uh, sorry, the Monash University FODMAP diet app was born. And, uh, and this, in its food guide, has an updated, continuing updated uh, list of all the foods that have been tested. So the diet, FODMAP dietary program that was designed was one in which we first of all avoided all foods high in FODMAP and replaced them with foods low in FODMAPs in each group. This would proceed for two to six weeks, depending upon uh, convenience more than anything. And then if there was no benefit, you would stop the diet. If there was efficacy, if there was amelioration of symptoms, we would then go on to a phase two or a reintroduction phase where the tolerance to individual FODMAPs and the, the amount of FODMAPs people can tolerate can be determined. And then that leads to a phase three, which is the personalised or maintenance diet, which is informed by the phase two information. All of this has in our hands and in most studies have been dietitian delivered. Now, the idea of the program is if you look at this stylized diagram, the FODMAP intake is on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. Gut symptoms are shown in red. So that, that uh, the symptoms are reduced when you reduce your FODMAPs, then you have this reintroduction phase in which some FODMAPs are found to be uh, quite a problem in the individual. And then you go to the personalization where the FODMAP intake is nowhere near as low as it was in the first phase and the symptoms continue to be improved. Well, does this work? Well, the first phase is very amenable to randomized controlled trials with certain difficulties. The problem of the comparator diet uh, is, uh, is always there, but these are the uh, early studies which really put FODMAP diet on the map. The first one was the, uh, the pivotal feeding study that Emma Halmos and our group uh, performed, and it showed that the, uh, that the FODMAP, low FODMAP diet had much less symptoms, much fewer symptoms in patients with IBS than a typical Australian FODMAP diet. They followed uh, studies from Canada versus a high FODMAP diet, UK versus habitual diet, USA versus a modified nice diet, and then an important uh, study from UK versus a placebo diet, and all showed benefit of the diet. Now, there have been now 13 randomized controlled trials and 944 patients involved. The trials have not all been of the highest quality, but an attempt was made to put them all together and has just been published. Uh, this was done by, um, uh, by a very good group of people who are extremely uh, fastidious in how they do these meta-analyses. And what you would show, I'll just show you the diet, the information here about comparing it to other diets, the low FODMAP diet for global symptoms uh, as shown here have uh, significantly uh, better uh, than all of the other diets. And none of the other diets, such as the NICE diet, were of, uh, of any uh, um, significant value in the patients. And so they found that the low FODMAP diet ranked first for efficacy across all endpoint study compared with the alternative interventions. They was more efficacious than habitual diet for global IBS symptoms. And when you compare it with the NICE diet, it was more efficacious for abdominal bloating and distension. Well, the personalized phase of the diet is much more difficult to study by a randomized controlled trial. But there are now eight published prospective studies with uh, three to 44 months of follow-up and more than 75% of patients who have responded to the uh, initial phase one have been able to reintroduce FODMAPs and go on to this personalized phase. The FODMAP, total FODMAP intake is often normal or only marginally reduced, but patients no longer have the binge intake 
of a large amount of FODMAPs in certain meals. Overall sustained symptom response has been uh, documented in 57 to 82%, depending on how that was assessed, and there's been no evidence of harm. Because of all these studies, the FODMAP diet is now established in guidelines in uh, many places in the world, and some of them are outlined here. Well, you have a diet, but how do you optimally deliver the diet? It's different to a drug where the drug is the drug, you, you give it, and that's it, whereas a diet is much more difficult to deliver. There are five aspects that I think are important in optimally delivering the diet. One is to being aware of the risks of the diet. You have to select your patients appropriately. You have to use the three-phase FODMAP strategy as, uh, as I have outlined. You utilise a FODMAP-trained dietitian, and then you might want to consider value-adding to the diet. So let's go through some of these aspects. The risks of instituting a FODMAP diet are common to all restrictive diets. Firstly, you don't want to exacerbate or precipitate disordered eating. You don't want to uh, do the same for nutritional uh, adequacy. There are psychosocial implications, and there are issues of when you're changing carbohydrate content, particularly of inducing a dysbiosis. But in fact, this has not been, uh, the, the evidence for this is uh, poor. Uh, and, and the studies so far that uh, have shown that changes to microbiota are largely reversed with the personalization diet. Now, I'd like to spend some time on, oh, the, the, sorry, the risks are exacerbated by inadequate assessment prior to the institution of the diet, by poor teaching of the diet. And the other thing that I think is important just to mention is that linear thinking by the, either the doctor or the uh, dietitian or the patient that the diet is the only part of management has to be avoided. And the diet is only one part of a multimodal exam, um, integrated care for people with IBS. So I'd like to spend some time on this issue of disordered eating and eating disorders as people get confused by it. Disordered eating is the irregular or maladaptive eating behaviours that may have nutritional or psychosocial implications, whereas eating disorders have severe and persistent disturbance of eating behaviours with clinically significant medical or social and or psychosocial consequences. And you'll be familiar with the anorexia nervosa, which is driven by the fear of gaining weight, but the more recently described ARFID, or avoidance restrictive food intake disorder is, is, is where there's an inability to, uh, to meet appropriate nutritional needs, which is driven by picky eating, poor appetite, or concern about symptom induction by food. The other one, orthorexia nervosa, is a preoccupation with healthy eating habits by individuals' belief system as to what is healthy or unhealthy. Now, in IBS, actually determining the prevalence of these is quite difficult because screening tools are not validated in IBS, where more than 60% of people do actually modify their diet anyway. However, where the published data tell us that concerning eating behaviours occur very commonly, and they've been reported from 5 to 44%, and probably we'd say about 15% would be a reasonable ballpark figure. What is more disturbing is that there's a lack of awareness of disordered eating behaviours in by gastroenterologists. Uh, in a study from uh, Michigan, that 13% that of patients attending a tertiary referral gastroenterology clinic actually had criteria for filling ARFID, 70% of those patients were sent by gastroenterologists for a FODMAP diet and no recognition that there was disordered eating patterns were observed. So awareness was very poor in this otherwise very highly talented group. We don't know whether 
institution of a FODMAP diet precipitates an eating disorder, but we do know that restrictive diets are contraindicated in patients with, with disordered eating behaviours unless they have adequate psychological support and it's done very carefully. So who should we be offering a FODMAP education to? A person should have functional gut symptoms. It's not a diet for good health. We want them to be motivated by food choice and they have to have sufficient FODMAPs in their habitual diet. Some people just avoid them. But where we should be worried is when someone has undernutrition, particularly disordered eating patterns, as I've mentioned, children where growth is very important and, uh, and uh, undernutrition is, uh, is a key issue. And if there are other dietary restrictions or they're already nutritionally uh, challenged, such as IBD, and if there's a poor capacity to apply the diet. And what we would say in these, we really need in these settings, a skilled dietitian and possibly a psychologist involved. And the all choices are to avoid the FODMAP diet, to use a, diet, a, a psychologist and to uh, very carefully use the FODMAP diet, or to use FOD, what we've called FODMAP gentle, which is a, a, a variation of the FODMAP diet, although it hasn't been assessed in its efficacy in other than in clinical practice. Can we predict who will respond to the diet or more importantly, who will not respond to the diet? But unfortunately, predictive tests are being developed, but none are clinically useful at the moment. So what does a dietitian offer? We say we like using a dietitian. So what is special about the GI dietitian? Well, they are very important in assessing. They're, they're skilled at assessing for disordered eating behaviours. They can assess nutritional and FODMAP intake of the patient, and they can assess the actual nutritional status of the patient. Therapeutically, they can advise on the, uh, on the suitability for dietary therapy, and our dietitians will tell us if this person is suitable or unsuitable. They ensure nutritional adequacy of any dietary chains. They can take people through the three phases of the FODMAP diet with, uh, uh, because they, have, they devote time to doing this and are skilled at doing it. And they can guide on practical issues like uh, how to incorporate the diet into recipes, um, how to read labels, things which I don't think gastroenterologists are particularly skilled at. So... What about a dietitian? Does the dietitian value add in the real world? Well, uh, uh, Carolyn Tuck, who, uh, who uh, trained with us and went to uh, Canada for a postdoc, she, she retrospectively evaluated 80 patients when she arrived in Kingston and, uh, and, and 80 consecutive patients in their clinic, 24 of them saw a dietitian and 56, uh, sorry, uh, 56 of them did not. When she looked at the inflammation of dietary phases, particularly in the phase two and phase three, those who did not see a dietitian, shown in the light gray here, performed particularly poorly. They ate more FODMAPs according to a food frequency questionnaire. However, their symptom levels were similar there was a lot who had uh, who didn't really improve, but why were the symptoms similar when this group here were doing the FODMAP diet better than this group? Well, the reason was that they that this group here who didn't see a dietitian were using multiple other dietary changes as well as much greater use of medication. So this confirmed that the dietitian can actually make a difference. Well, what about using Dr. Google? Well, the, Dr. Google is very unreliable. FODMAP lists on the, uh, are often, are often uh, wrong. And the readability and quality of uh, what's on the, uh, what's on, on uh, Google, as well as the dietary advice for IBS is really quite uh, uh, diverse and often quite uh, against evidence base. 
Well, the problem in the real world is that we don't have access to FODMAP trained dietitians everywhere. Well, what do we do? Well, where there are dietitians available, but they're not trained, we can invest in educating them. And I can tell you it is worthwhile. When dietitians are not available, perhaps the doctor can upskill or other health professionals can. And in some circumstances, nurses have been very good at learning uh, delivery of the, uh, of the diet. And we can ask the patients to do online teaching or give them uh, good information. But what I would not recommend is the paper, what I call the paper plane method, and that's throwing a piece of paper at the people and say, here, follow this diet. It's not a good technique. We have invested in trying to help with this education, and we have a dietitian health professional course of 10 modules, takes 25 hours to complete, and it is excellent. Uh, but we've also developed a much shorter patient education module. And our, our app has uh, lots of information on the diet in it. There are other ways of learning. So can we value add to the FODMAP diet? Well, bifidobacteria uh, tend to be lower with the phase one, lower in their relative abundance, not in all hands, but in many hands. And in fact, this here from uh, London, from the King's College, showed that the bifidobacteria were lower here, but they could correct this with a probiotic. So is, should we be using a probiotic? Well, there was no symptomatic benefit. And when you go into the, uh, the personalized phase in this same group, they found that the bifidobacteria went back to uh, their normal abundance and uh, really there was no ongoing problem. So I don't think this is really where an area we can value add. The area of more uh, perhaps concern is that in many, uh, many patients do reduce their fibre intake. And this was uh, from a New Zealand study of an experienced FODMAP trained dietitian who found that in phase one, dietary fibre intake did reduce. Reasons why fibre might be important is that that the FODMAP diet itself doesn't have consistent change in fecal water. It doesn't change the character of the stools. They might be, patients might be more happy with their stools, but that doesn't change the character of the stools. And perhaps fibre, that's what fibre can do. And when you reduce your FODMAPs, you're reducing distal colonic fermentation. And in some, in some studies, there is a reduced delivery of short chain fatty acids to the distal colon, which is supposedly very, uh, very health promoting. And there's increased protein fermentation. And both of these combined have likely have an impact on long-term colonic health. So can fiber change this? And so what, what we have done, Dan So has just finished these studies, which are uh, yet to be fully published that he, we took patients who were starting a low FODMAP diet and we fed them all their food. We gave them a low FODMAP diet with either supplement with a minimally fermented fiber or a fermented fiber in resistant starch. And what he did was, was looked at their habitual diet and we randomized them to one of the three conditions here and then crossed over to the two other conditions. The first issue was, were, was the fiber going to make the control of symptoms with the low FODMAP diet worse? And whether we used the visual analog scale or the IBS SSS, there was no real effect. Slightly suggestion that maybe the re fermentable resistant starch might increase the symptoms, but this was not significant. And no one stop the study. The stool output with the fiber increased and most importantly, the stool consistency improved. And so what this here shows is the change in stool water content. And you can see here that with the sugarcane fiber that 
the dry stools became wetter, normal stools remained normal, and the loose stools became drier. And this was really the non-fermentable fiber was responsible for this. The combination had no, ben no extra benefit. What about fermentation? Well, we know that when you put uh, resistant starch into people that you get more short chain fatty acids produced as shown here by the plasma uh, acetate concentration that went up in the combined group. To look at where fermentation was occurring, we use the, the uh, uh, experimental but uh, gas sensing capsule, which can measure hydrogen concentrations through the bowel as well as the, the um, uh, as well as where this is occurring. And we divided up the, the colon into regions determined by their transit time. So Q1 was the proximal and Q4 the distal. And the hydrogen concentrations are shown here. I've only shown the medians, but you can see here that without a fiber supplement or, or indeed with the uh, 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 with just a non-fermentable fibre, there was a, a reduced fire fermentation in the distal colon. Whereas when you use the combination, the fermentation increased and you got, you got even fermentation right throughout the bowel. So what, what we uh, defined by these studies was if you're initiating a low FODMAP diet and you wish to use a fibre supplement, a minimally fermentable fiber will improve normalizer stool water content. If you add, if you put in a, a fermented, fi fermentable fiber, it will enhance fermentation. But if you give them both, you won't make the symptoms worse, but you'll spread the fermentation across, right across the bowel to the distal colon. So this will value add the diet. So in summary, my messages would be that efficacious, uh, that the diet, the FODMAP dietary strategy is efficacious for IBS. It's evidence-based and is in national guidelines. The diet has matured to a dynamic process of reintroduction and personalization phases with maintenance of efficacy in the longer term. The optimal use of the diet, however, really does require for us as, uh, as uh, medical practitioners to understand the risks of a restrictive diet, to be aware of disordered eating and the need to assess, assess for it prior to instituting a diet, that it would optimally be used if you actively involve a FODMAP trained dietitian or other health professional who, is, who has undergone such training. And we may have uh, potential in value adding with specific fiber types. And personalized therapy is really the rule. You have to always consider, like you do for any drug therapy, the risks versus likely benefits. I'd like to finish by just saying that, that all of this work has been the result of a multidisciplinary team here and uh, too many people to, to, to name, but uh, Jane Muir, she is the, uh, uh, the leader of the pack together with me she is known as mother, I'm known as grandfather. Thank you.